And a very good morning to you. Hope you're well this Sunday. It's April 8th, 2018. A muggy old morning it is in South Manchester. I hope you've had a good weekend thus far. I hope you've relaxed, you've enjoyed yourself with your loved ones and you've chilled out. Unless, of course, you work weekends, in which case you won't have done that. This is Sunday View, by the way. It's where I look at the front pages of the UK's national broadsheets and tabloids. We have a look at the stories on the front pages and one or two stories within as well. As usual, if you'd like to speak with me or talk to me, you can do so through the medium of Twitter. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's how you tweet me. Tweet me your thoughts, opinions, and I'll be reading them out as I go along. Welcome to Sunday View. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv Yes, Sunday View it is then, April 8th, live on richieallen.co.uk where you can see the front pages of the newspapers, by the way. Check them out. This is Sunday View. Thanks for joining me. Let's make it a good one. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yes, a muggy old day indeed it is, but it's warm, it's warm. Don't hit the microphone there, Richie. It's warm, it's nice, it's spring-ish. It feels very spring-ish today. I'm looking forward to getting out for a bit of fresh air myself this afternoon. Right before uh, we go anywhere, I wanted just to uh, say a big uh, hello and a massive congratulations to my great friend, Jean Ann Crowley, who after a bit of an absence returned triumphantly to the boards, to the stage on Friday, on Friday evening at the Arts Centre in Dublin. Now she performed Mary Kenny's brand new endeavour, brand new play, called uh, Dearest Old Darling, which is about the great Irish historical figure, Constance Markovich, and Jean Ann played Constance. It was a full house on Friday, and I was on Twitter over the last couple of days, and I saw that the plaudits were flying in from everywhere. Apparently, uh, she was magnificent. Class is permanent. It's an old cliche, but it really is. So huge congratulations to Jean Ann Crowley and the arts scene in my country, in Ireland, is all the better for having people like Jean Ann Crowley, uh, especially returning to the boards, as I said. So well done, Jean Ann. Top, a top banana to Jean Ann. Rave reviews indeed. Just before we take a look at the Sunday papers, which we are going to do, of course, as it's Sunday View, there's a developing story this morning. I noticed, as I've been looking on Twitter and on Facebook in the last 25, 30 minutes, I noticed there's a lot of talk about it. The developing story is, is that there has been a claim that there has been yet another chemical attack in Syria, chemical weapons attack, and it is being blamed on the government in Syria, the Assad government. Here's Sky News leading into this story this morning. This is the top story. So before we look at the papers, we have to talk a bit about this. Well, on sunrise this morning, we start with the news that at least 70 people, many of them children, are thought to have died in a chemical weapons attack in Syria. Groups with links to the country's opposition have told us that more than 500 people were injured in the attack last night in the town of Douma in eastern Ghouta. The Syrian government has denied the reports, accusing its opponent of making chemical attack fabrications. But the US State Department said the Assad regime must be held accountable and that Russia bears responsibility for failing to stop its ally from using chemical weapons. Well, after days of relative calm, Russian-backed forces resumed their barrage of a suburb of the Syrian capital Damascus in the eastern Ghouta region. Duma is the only town that remains in opposition hands after the regime recaptured nearly all of the region in an offensive that began in February. Right, Gillian Joseph and Stephen Dixon there. We've heard this one before time and again. Assad is using chemical weapons against his own people. Right, and obviously that is followed by the award-winning hit while the Russians are enabling him to do it. Now, Julia Hartley Brewer is a broadcaster, allegedly, used to write for the Telegraph newspaper, she's certain 
as much as she can be from her comfortable sofa on the Andrew Marr show, well, she's certain that Assad did it. So let's, let's all be terribly surprised at the idea, oh, are the Russians using chemical weapons? Well, they're backing a Syrian regime which is using chemical weapons. It's, be, it's believed uh, at overnight this uh, attack on civilians in eastern Ghouta, leading, of course, all the news broadcasts today. A hideous uh, story. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the, the, the Guardian copy from earlier this morning saying 41 dead. It looks like, I think, 70 mm. possibly, and many, many hundreds more. Again, targeting Awful. innocent civilians, uh, children uh, hitting this chemical attack. We, we've got to stop the nonsense that they are not using chemical weapons. They are yeah. using them. And, of course, I have to say, I do think we need to remember that it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was a hot country that chose mm. not to get involved, even after chemical weapons attacks, mm. uh, as a result of votes in Parliament, led by and, a and former the, Labour leader, the, Ed the Miliband. Mid the Middle East is aflame again. I mean, there's, there's lots of Palestinian Never kids being, being killed further south as well by the... Israeli forces. But, but these are lessons. We learnt lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan of what happens when we do it, when we get involved and mm. get it wrong. Well, now we've learnt about what happens when we don't get okay. involved and get it yeah. wrong. Yeah. Mar tried to chip in there with a bit of, well, the Israelis are murdering innocent Palestinian people, which they are, but then the Israelis do that before breakfast most days. Let's just shoot a few Palestinians, why not? Nobody cares. So he tries to interject with a bit of Palestinians. Obviously, Brewer was never going to go down that road. The Middle East is aflame, said Marr. But Marr's conduct before that was dreadful. Hartley Brewer said, let's not tolerate any nonsense anymore that he's not using chemical weapons. He is, she says. She must be a remote viewer, Julia Hartley Brewer. There you go. I could be a rap artist yet. She must be an exponent of remote viewing from a lovely, comfortable sofa in a studio near the Thames. She's able to say for a fact that chemical weapons were used and they were used by the Assad government. Hmm. So then, Sky News got on a man who used to be a chemical weapons inspector. So you think, huh, hark, this is good. They have a man who used to be a chemical weapons inspector. This is good. Let's ask him a few good questions. They said the man's name is Jerry Smith. Jerry Smith. I was immediately sceptical. Jerry Smith doesn't sound like a chemical weapons ex inspector, does he? Jerry Smith sounds more like your buddy, doesn't he? Sounds like the guy you have a few beers with after work on a Friday. Jerry's the sort of guy that picks you up when you're pissed and you can't find your way home. He does a bit of wallpapering for you. He organised your stag do. He's always in the bookies, Jerry Smith. You don't imagine Jerry Smith is a chemical weapons inspector. Sadly, we didn't find out really what he knows about chemical weapons because... Well, he was interviewed on Sky News where the interview, in inverted commas, became more about we need to do something about Assad. Well, yes, good morning. It's, uh, it's depressingly regular. Um, it's a year ago to the month that we saw the, the attack in Khan Shikun and, and here we are again with what looks like a, a mass casualty event with a, a, a number of, of people, certainly the video I've seen so far, which don't appear to have any traumatic injuries, but have clearly suffered uh, some kind of intoxication, uh, poisoning and death. And what is the role of the international community in all of this? I mean, what, what sanctions can be? Sorry, Gillian, but your next question should be, can we be sure? How can we be certain that the weapons were even in the hands of the government, number one? And number two, how can we be sure they were deployed by government troops? He's a chemical weapons expert, Gillian. You don't bring him on to ask him what should be done about it. You bring him on to talk about it, love. He's there as an expert in chemical weapons. That's his job. Let the discussion about what we should do about it, let that fall into the hands of elected officials. This guy apparently knows a lot about chemical weapons, right? But have clearly suffered uh, some kind of intoxication, uh, poisoning and death. And what is the role of the international community in all of this? Disgraceful, disgraceful garbage dressed up as journalism. That question should have been, how do you know? How could we be sure? What are the footprints? What are the fingerprints that we should be looking for? Jerry, you know all about the weapons, but of course this is Sky I mean, what, what sanctions can be employed Sanctions! Against sanctions! This guy doesn't work for the UN. He's a chemical weapons inspector. Or used to be, Jerry Smith. Against their regime. Well, again, we've seen uh, over these past seven years of the Syrian conflict, the United Nations attempting to you know, bring humanity to this conflict, in fact, stop the conflict. And there have been a number of initiatives that have sadly 
not gone as far and has been as successful as as one would might have liked. So I assume it will be a, a, another um, depressingly familiar approach in the uh, in the international system in the United Nations uh, in uh, in New York to try and and stop this horrific events uh, occurring. Yeah, Jerry Smith, the former weapons inspector, is depressed that no action will be taken. Wow. So he finishes there. So presumably Gillian Joseph then, surely at this stage she asks him, can you lend your expertise, Jerry, to explain how we know it was a sad? Of course not. And, I mean, the question is, really, what what is the next step? Because... Ah! Ask him, Gillian! Fuck! Ask him! He's a chemical weapons inspector. Talk to us about the weapons, Jerry. What are they? How are they manufactured? How could the, 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 the regime, man, how could they have got them? We know that he gave up all his chemical weapons a few years ago. But no, she keeps asking Jerry, what should we do, Jerry? Bombed a fucking lot of them. That seems to be Jerry's attitude. Because it, it, it's always been a, a, an escalation of, of the use of these weapons. Uh, and then we've seen perhaps, uh, you know, some lit service paid to, to actually stopping this. Uh, and then nothing happens and there's silence until the next attack. Well, absolutely. We saw last year with President Trump uh, after the Khan Shakun attack, uh, where there was that attack on the on the Syrian airfield, where the U.S. believed the uh, the attack was actually launched from. So it would be interesting to see whether the U.S. again uh, react to that. But uh, the the nature of of our recent history, um, the Western interventions into places like uh, Iraq, have meant that um, you know direct action is something that perhaps our Western populations are not particularly supportive of now. And Jerry finds that lamentable. Jerry finds the fact that we don't fall for the old bullshit the dictator is murdering his people story that we don't support these foreign interventions anymore. And he laments that. This guy, remember, was brought on as a former chemical weapons inspector and all he's been doing is advocating war. Murder. Third time lucky, maybe, maybe just before he goes, maybe she'll ask him to talk about his alleged area of expertise, chemical weapons. Uh, um, perhaps uh, sourcing the, the, the chemical weapons. I mean, where are they coming from? Who's supplying these weapons? 17 to 1, Iran. 12 to 1, China. 4 to 9 on, North Korea. That's my bet. That's my bet. Well, I mean, Syria declared a large quantity of chemical agent in 2013 and uh, over the, the next year that was all removed from Syria. Exactly, which I just said a minute ago. Syria doesn't have any chemical weapons at all. If the international community signed off on this, well, it has to be North Korea, right? So either Syria didn't declare all its chemical agent or it's acquired more. More recently, a UN report was leaked where a number of vessels were intercepted travelling from North Korea hey. to Syria, and that may well be a source of supply. Brilliant stuff. Sky News, a carnival of cack, disguised as news. A carnival of cack-a-poo-poo. Rubbish. This guy's mantra was effectively, we must do something, we must do something, it was North Korea. Jerry, remember, before you go on Sky News this morning, your briefing points, we got to do something, we got to do something, Jerry, and it, it was North Korea, man. Fuck's sake. Monumental bollocks. Anyway, the papers. The papers. Let's move on to the papers. The Sunday Telegraph front page. This is Sunday View. Live with me, Richie Allen, on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester. Triggerwarning.tv. And, of course, we're on TuneIn Radio, where we have been since day one. The Sunday Telegraph front page headline reads thus. Rudd, Rudd, police have enough bobbies to tackle crime. This is Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary. She's saying that police cuts are not to blame for rising crime. They are. She said forces have the officers and the funding to tackle the violence on Britain streets. They don't. She was given her own column in the Sunday Telegraph. She has unveiled a serious violence task force to face the problem. She says the time for warm words and political quarrels is over. This speech she made is very similar to a speech 
that Theresa May gave to the Police Federation in 2014 when May was Home Secretary. Rudd says, as we confront this issue, I know that the time, uh, excuse me, I know the same arguments and criticisms will emerge. This is all because you've been, you've been reading about, you've been hearing about knife crime in London. There have been more people murdered in London in 2018 than in New York, which has a vastly uh, higher population than London. The truth of it is, of course, that th- she's lying. We, we won't dwell too much on this story. Um, police Policing and police forces have been cut. Police stations are closing all over the country. Dozens in Birmingham uh, this year alone. What police are left have to go back to the station and spend hours filling in paperwork when there is an incident of any kind which results in there not being policemen and women out and about as there used to be many, many years ago. This is deliberate. They're back at the ranch filling out uh, paperwork, sometimes in triplicate, in quadruplicate, and large areas of the city are unmanned, whether it's London, Manchester, I I think I told you before, coming back from a rugby league match not so long ago. It was an evening uh, game and there was a a minor incident uh, on Princess Road, which is a major road into, which is a major road in and out of Manchester, major uh, uh, carriageway, I suppose. Uh, Rolled the window down, a couple of police guys there, spoke to them for a couple of minutes and got out of them that those guys were on duty for the night and it was the only squad car covering Moss Side, Princess Road and Hume, basically. Massive areas, one car. Right? That's what's happening. And of course, privatisation will be the solution part of that problem reaction solution scenario. Also on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph today, dear listener, is the headline, and we will talk about this in a minute, Screepals should be offered witness protection amid safety fears. That's really convenient, that, isn't it? We might never hear from the Screepals, which will inevitably lead to speculation that the Screepals either died and or, or, or were killed somewhere else and this is all one big massive hoax. Some some people will speculate about that. I'm not saying I will. But if the Skripals are, you know, whisked away into witness protection and they don't speak with anybody and the media doesn't get access to them, well, it's going to leave a million questions, isn't it? We'll come back to this in a minute, by the way, because it's in other newspapers today. Imagine, you might never, ever hear from the Skripals personally. How convenient. The Mail on Sunday leads with this Maze stop and search U-turn on gang wars. Now, because of all these stabbings and zombie knives and all of this in the news, Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary at the Conservative Party conference, she introduced a young black man from Crystal Palace who had been stopped more than 20 times and searched despite the fact that he had no criminal history. You might remember this. The man's name was Alexander Paul quite right he'd be pissed off I'd be pissed off if I was stopped constantly just because of the way I looked anyway at the time May said that this had to stop you couldn't just be randomly stopping and searching people and especially when all the evidence pointed to the fact that black uh, black British citizens were being targeted and were being unfairly uh, harassed and were ten times more likely to be searched and all the rest of it but apparently we will get new proposals from this government in the wake of all the knife crime that will basically step up uh, a stop and search programme. That's alleged in the Sunday Mail anyway. We don't know yet. Now the Sunday Times, back to the Skripals. Front page, Skripals offered new identities with CIA help. Skripals offered new identities with CIA help. How wonderful, how lovely. Sergei and Yulia Skripal will be offered new identities and a new life in America in an attempt to protect them from further murder attempts, according to the Sunday Times. Intelligence officials at MI6 have had all discussions or have had discussions with their counterparts in the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, about resettling the Skripals in America. They will be offered new identities, according to a senior Whitehall figure. Senior sources even revealed both victims were conscious and would soon begin helping investigators with their inquiries. This attack 
allegedly took place on the 4th of March, a month ago, and apparently Julius Gripal, who is speaking and is alert and is up and about and walking around, she has apparently or allegedly rejected the offer of a visitation by the Russian embassy in London. They want to provide the Skripals with consular support, but some news agencies this morning are saying that Yulia has said, no, I don't want to speak to the Russians. I was speculating about this last week. Well, if they're telling Yulia and her father, well, uh, it was the Russians who tried to kill you, presumably they wouldn't want to meet with them. In the Sunday Times today also, I mean, this is very interesting, This we might put them in witness protection, very interesting. Also in the Sunday Times, Bojo the Clown, the blathering idiot that is the UK Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, he launched an attack on Jeremy Corbyn, accusing Corbyn of being the Kremlin's useful idiot. That's a quote, by the way, because Corbyn won't blame Russia for the poison plot. I uh, Go on, Jeremy, say it was the Russians. No, say it was the Russians, Jeremy. No, R Jeremy, say it's the Russians. No, you're a useful idiot. That's the way it goes in politics these days, right? Bojo said that Jeremy was playing Putin's game by refusing to say unequivocally that the Russian state was responsible. We must have, at some stage in the last 20 years, something happened. You know, we stepped through a door or a room and the, the world changed it didn't happen maybe it did happen overnight we now have a lunatic asylum for a reality there is no evidence the Russians were behind any attack on the Skripals yet you have government ministers in the most senior positions telling other people blame the Russians blame the Russians blame the Russians alright you're a commie you're a commie lover or you're Putin's puppet or whatever. This is this is what it's degenerated to. It's unbelievable. To me, who's been in this business for a long time. Madness. And, of course, it wouldn't be happening if there was a media doing its job and ultimately destroying Boris Johnson, which is what the media should be doing. And it's very easy. It's all there for the media to completely destroy Johnson and May and all the other tyrants and Zionists in the, in, 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 in the British uh, government office, in the cabinet. Madness. I mean, it must be something to be called a useful idiot by a cretin like Boris Johnson. Back to the Andrew Marr show. Have a listen to Julia Hartley Brewer and Polly Toynbee from The Guardian. And Andrew Marr chips in as well. They're talking about the latest on the Skripals or the Skripals, the latest in terms of their health, this idea that they would go to witness protection. You'll hear a bit of Julia Hartley Brewer first. Have a listen. This from the Mar Show today. Five weeks on, it is extraordinary. And the fact that this is also obviously front page news in Russia, as we've been discovering this week, with the, with the niece of Sergei Skripal on the television virtually Absolutely. every night. I mean, a few weeks ago, to be, to be ghoulish about it, would be, not to be ghoulish about it, we thought they were dying. I mean, that was what was being said at the and hospital. And they'd never regain consciousness, and now they're talking. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary. And, and, and thank goodness. Uh, and thank goodness also for the police officer as well, who could have also possibly lost his life. Um, but this is an interesting thing. I, I, think, I think the more interesting thing about this is not that actually the idea that the Americans could help with offering uh, alternative identities and a new life in America, much easier to protect them. Uh, the, the concern being they have to be in a Five Eyes country, one of our biggest sort of staunchest allies, but we know that we can uh, it can keep them safe. A but Five uh, Eyes. Five country. Eyes. Well, you know, oh, yes, it's Five, five Eyes. eyes. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically Anglo, it's the Anglo sphere uh, to all intents okay, and right. purposes. Um, but, um, but, but it's interesting that the, the Russians are demanding to meet with, the, with, with uh, Yulia now she's awake. Uh, Yulia apparently doesn't want to meet with them. And of course, we know yes. Yesterday, we, this, this, the niece's uh, 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 visa hasn't been granted. But it is interesting what, what uh, Boris Johnson has said, because we had some extraordinary scenes this week at uh, the Russian embassy, with the Russian ambassador playing sort of comical alley. We were back to Iraq, it was, Baghdad. It was very bizarre. Yes, there's nothing to oh. see here while the bombs what, are dropping Boris behind right. Did Hartley Brewer just compare the Russian ambassador, Alexander Yakovenko, to comical alley? She did. And Andrew Marr endorsed it by saying, yeah, it's really bizarre. But everything the Russian ambassador said about Theresa May and Boris Johnson and the UK's attitude to the investigation and the UK breaking protocol by not allowing the Russians have a sample of the alleged agent, everything the Russian ambassador has said is true. It's provably true. 
There isn't anything comical Ali about that. Polly Toynbee from The Guardian, she has, um, she pitches her oar right in. So what Boris is writing today in the papers, uh, trying to escalate... It's in the Sunday Times. Mm. It's in the yeah. Sunday Times, uh, trying to exculpate himself. He has bungled yep. yet again on one of the most crucial uh, diplomatic. He is the most well, undiplomatic... He doesn't do foreign. detail, and foreign office requires... Well, all He's politics lazy, requires detail. Lazy, yeah. sloppy... Uh, never reads his brief. You so think just, what he's just, done to the, no, Ara I think, the I think Iranian to fair, captive. Just, just to remind people, what we're talking about here is that there was an interview with the guy heading Porton Down, and he said, yes, we have Which identified Which was also a car this. crash interview. Yes, yeah. we, we've identified this as Novichok. We don't know where it came from. And that um, seemed to contradict what Boris Johnson had told German television, where he said he had absolutely, they were absolutely categorical. No, he'd spoken to the guy so at his Down. his words, absolutely categorical. It wasn't quite, there wasn't actually a question yeah. there. He said, so this guy, no question about mm -hmm. it. And uh, the handling of, as we know, the handling of sensitive uh, intelligence information is so important. You get it wrong, you well, discredit but, but everything. But it's interesting that the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, isn't even given the most sensitive information yeah. because he's not, so it's not well, what's trusted. interesting is that but, but, Boris Johnson here is trying to put the blame onto Corbyn. I mean, Corbyn is not the story in this. Whether he uh, acted well or badly, he's not the story. The main, you know, he's calling him infantile and a Kremlin's useless idiot, use, useful idiot. It actually, the story has been this week, the idiocy of Boris I, Johnson. I, look, I absolutely agree. I, mean, I think absolutely total incompetence from Boris Johnson. I wouldn't have him in the job in the first place. But, um, but, but the reality is, when you have the official leader of Her well, Majesty's opposition uh, basically spouting Kremlin lines on I, this I issue, I don't think it's not irrelevant. I'm nervously and worriedly going to not stand up for <laughs> him. But yeah, he's not going to stand up for Corbyn. Andrew Marr, as you heard him say there. That's crazy stuff, this. Speaking of useful idiots, Tory MP and Community Secretary Chuka Umuna was asked by Marr if it's acceptable for Bojo the Clown to use that language in describing Corbyn. Boris Johnson has called um, the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, the Kremlin's useful fool this morning. Do you think that's suitable language for the Foreign Secretary to use at a time of national crisis when it comes to our relationships with Russia? Well, the, the, there's no doubt when it comes up against this issue with Russia that we're having, this very serious issue, that Jeremy Corbyn has let the British people down. There's no question about that. But this is, this, this, well, is, a, this, this is a much bigger issue than any one individual. I mean, let's, let's look at the, the facts here. There's been an attempted assassination on British streets with an illegal chemical weapon that we know is manufactured in Russia. That's what we know. And it, it, it is the fact that Sergei Skripal is now apparently able to talk, is that a very important moment in this investigation? Will this change things now we're able to talk to the Skripals? Well, I, I, first of all, I obviously I welcome the fact that, uh, that he's better, his daughter is better. Mm -hmm. I think it will be an important moment if he can give more detail on what he believes has happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's for the police investigation. But one thing we are absolutely clear on, there's been a lot of talk about this this mm -hmm. week, and there's been a lot of misinformation and lies from the Russian government again and again. We're absolutely clear. There's no other okay. plausible explanation Why? than Russia being responsible for okay. this attempted assassination on British soil. Why are we not allowing the niece, Victoria Skripal, to come to this country? And why are we not giving the Russians access to Julia and, and Sergei Skripal? The Russians have every right to ask for access to any Russian but citizen, but, no it's up to them, but, it, but it's up to that citizen to decide if they want to meet the Russian authorities. And you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Skripals don't want to meet the Russian authorities. And the cousin? Why is she not being allowed to come here? Well, let the cousin make an application and we'll consider it. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Sajid Javi. Yeah, that of course I'm an idiot. I said Chuka Amuna. I was thinking about Chuka Amuna as I was playing that clip. The, Of course, the Labour politician. You heard Sajid Javid there. He's the community secretary. He looks nothing like Chuka Amuna. I, had, I was thinking about Chuka Amuna at the time. Yes, that was Sajid Javid there who basically ignored the question Mar put to him about what Johnson had said about Jeremy Corbyn. And then he said they'd look into granting the visa application to um, the family members of the Skripals who want to come and visit them there. Sajid Javid, yes, yes, of course. Mea culpa, mea, mea culpa. Tell you what, it was interesting to hear former US diplomat Jim Jatras say that the Russians should now adopt the policy of accusing the United Kingdom of being behind it 
and demanding that the UK offers proof that it wasn't. Interest in tactics, Jim Jutras speaking with Orti. The people making these accusations themselves do not believe them and in fact know that they are not true. And if I were in the Russians' shoes, and it's not my job to give them uh, advice, but instead of saying, well, we didn't do it, where's the proof, we want a joint investigation, I would turn around and say, look, these two Russian citizens were poisoned on your territory, Great Britain, within 10 miles of your top chemical weapons facility. Unless we hear otherwise, we presume you're responsible for this. We demand proof that you're not. Uh, I, look, this idea that somehow the, the British are just sort of jumping to a conclusion, I think is much too fair here and too fair to the American government as well. I think there's a deliberate provocation going yeah, on I here do too. and that they know that they're making false charges, just as is in the case of the WMDs in Iraq. I think most of the people making those accusations knew full well that Saddam Hussein did not have WMDs, but they were making the accusation sure. anyway because it served their purpose. Jim Jutras there. It's half past 11 as I record this live. Thanks for joining Sunday View, the 8th of April 2018. Good to have your company. If you're just joining the programme, uh, the big story this morning is, is, is that it has been alleged that a chemical weapons attack has taken place in Douma, the last rebel-held town in eastern Ghouta in Syria. It has been alleged chemical weapons were used. At least 70 people have died. Again, it has been alleged. The images and the videos have been provided by the very dubious White Helmet Group, which I've talked a lot about on this programme over the last couple of years. There has been no independent verification of these reports. And of course, the talking heads have already begun to blame the Assad government and have begun to blame Russia because it is enabling him to do that. I've said a million times, I'm not going to keep saying it, there is nothing to gain. There is no gain, there is no benefit whatsoever for the, for, for the Syrian government to deploy chemical weapons, which it doesn't have, by the way. As we heard from your man Smith earlier on, they don't have any chemical weapons. And in order to back up this garbage, this, these fake reports that he's dropping these weapons, which again, he has no gain. There's no gain in it. They're trying to say that he's getting them from North Korea. It's rubbish, this. Absolute rubbish. If weapons of a chemical nature were deployed in Duma, they were deployed by either by these uh, so-called uh, moderate rebels. They still use this term to describe lunatic jihadists that they unleashed into the country or they were deployed by the Turks, or they were deployed by, well, why not? Why not those British and American super soldiers that are operating inside Syria anyway, completely illegally, contravening any number of international laws? Maybe they used it, uh, weapons of, of, of this nature to blame the Assad government. But that's the big story today anyway. Going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we're going to change tack and move away from Russia and Syria and poisoning and all the rest of it. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. 
They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www.markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Welcome back to the program. Mentioned Jean Ann Crowley earlier on and her triumphant return on Friday. Mentioned that at the top of the show. Uh, she's been listening to the last few minutes of the program. Makes an excellent point about David Kelly, Dr. David Kelly's suicide. Of course, he was the weapons inspector who uh, could be here all day. Um, it was alleged that he took his own life using co-proximal tablets and cutting his wrists. Um, he had been named, of course, as the BBC source. Uh, he knew all about the dodgy dossier. It's my contention that, that David Kelly was murdered, of course. Uh, Jean Ann says, uh, Robin Cook's heart attack or David Kelly's suicide. Amazing. Remarkable if the British establishment had shown a quarter of the interest in those cases as they have shown in the poisoned Ruskies story. That's a point very well made. Uh, good morning to Base Ninja who says, I loan up it was me, Richie. I gave the weapons to Assad. I got them cheap on St. John's Market in Liverpool. Shh. I also gave Vlad the nod as well, says Base Ninja. Tommy says, Richie, why are they not calling yesterday's attack in Germany terrorism? I've no idea, Tommy. A man drove a car in the town of Munster into a crowd, didn't he? And some people were injured. And I think some people were killed. And and then he allegedly shot himself in, in the head. I have no idea why they're not calling it terrorism. I've not been following the story. Maybe you've got an opinion you might share with me. Jeff tweets, who first broke the story of the gassing? Once again, qui bono. Dean tweets, uh, the Russian government are doing nothing but lie according to our provably lying politicians and lying media. Our government and the USA have never lied. Let's just let the nukes fly and have done with it. Uh, good morning to Moinga as well. Uh, to everybody else who's tweeting. To David, by the way, David Kona, who tweets, I wonder if the Skripals will be sending their former neighbour a Christmas card this year. You know, Richie, the one who said that they should be allowed to die. That's a good point, that. Sky rolled him out, didn't they, 10 days ago? And he said that his understanding was they were so badly, they were in such bad shape, they were in such bad shape that they would be better off dying. It looks like the Skripals are in great form. Martin tweets, did the Skripals have food poisoning? Maybe. Good morning to Pat Garrett. Uh, good morning, Pat. Nice to hear from you. Nice to know you're listening to the programme. David Stanford tweets, if there was enough real police, then there wouldn't be the abundance of the plastic plod with no more authority than you or I. Their crime-fighting superpowers are calling the real deal. Superman and Batman, watch out. David is making reference there to the fact that we do see police community support officers. Is that what they're called? PCSOs, police community support officers. They don't have powers of arrests. They wear a uniform. And if they see something happening, they have to phone the real police. A bit mad. Good morning to Delroy. Morning, Delroy. Nice to hear from you. Good morning to Annalise too, who says, Richie, funny how they never seem to have a problem with the British regime killing its own people. Something that can actually be proven. I would say, Annalise, proven quite easily. Tweet at Richie Allen Show. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Lovely to have your company this Thursday, this Sunday even, this Sunday. I'm taking a bit of stick for Chuka Amuna as well. I don't mind. I deserve it. <laughs> Sajid Javid is the community secretary. It was him on the Andrew Marr show. Chuka Amuna is not even in the same political party. I know. I know. I'm a plonker. I'm a plonker. Right, let's move on because I want to talk about this for a couple of minutes. Um, oh, I've got a couple of newspapers to do. The Sunday Observer, their headline is £50 million backing for a new party to break mould of UK politics. This is speculation, really, that a new centrist party is being secretly developed and has been for a year by a network of entrepreneurs, philanthropists and donors who want 
to break the Westminster mould. It's being spearheaded by a former Labour benefactor who's drawn up uh, a group of wealthy people frustrated by the tribal nature of politics. Simon Franks is the man, the multimillionaire philanthropist and founder of love film Simon Franks. Apparently he's had full-time staff working for as long as a year looking to set up a new political party. This smells of the movement in France that brought about Emmanuel Macron. This smells a bit dodgy, this, right? That's in the Sunday Observer, which is free to read online if you want to check it out. And speaking of Emmanuel Macron and centrists and dodgy people, mass murderer Tony Blair is in all the papers again today because he's been asking Germany to do everything that Germany can uh, to everything that Merkel can. He's asking Merkel, Merkel to do everything possible to keep Britain in the European Union. Blair has been a prominent advocate to remain in the EU, writes the, 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 the Mail on Sunday. He's now urged Merkel to do her best to reverse the decision and he talked the usual bollocks about why it's so terrible, so wrong, so awful and all of that. And we're all going to implode and everybody's going to lose every cent they ever had if we leave the European Union. The same bullshit from Blair. Blair. But I came across an interview this morning. I found it very interesting indeed and I grabbed it and I'm glad I did. It was an interview with John Nichols. Now you probably never heard of John unless you live in Whitstable in Kent. John's a retired fisherman and he worked for Fishing for Leave. Fishing for Leave was a pro-Brexit campaign group and John can see what's happening with the transition period and he is witnessing how fishermen are being shafted and will be shafted as they have been for the best part of the last 50 years. Have a listen to John Nichols speaking with Sky News earlier today. Well actually what we need is an absolute clean break um, when we leave um, the the market um, next year. Um, the problem we've got at the moment is the transition period because the day we leave um, the EU, one second after that um, is implemented, we hand back control of our fisheries to the EU um, and then we have no say over it whatsoever for the 21 months of the transition period. And our biggest fear is the status quo. Um, what we'll have, I believe, and all the fishermen believe is that there will be no change. We become a bargaining chip in, in this country's negotiations with the EU and uh, we're going to be the losers once again. We were the losers 50 years ago when Edward Heath took us in and we're going to be the losers this time again. If we can get back control of our fisheries, it's worth six to eight billion pounds for the local economy, for the UK economy. Um, you know, harbours around the coast, um, fishing communities, um, coastal communities will benefit um, massively from taking back control of our waters. But if we give that opportunity away, and I believe we're going to give it away in the transition period, we will be scuppered for the second time in 50 years. Brilliant. Top man, John Nichols. Very, very good. And it looked beautiful where he was. They had him on the, the pier there, uh, there in Whitstable. Now, the, pre the, the presenter, our friend Gillian Joseph from earlier, then hilariously hilariously asks John, why don't you trust the government? Why don't you just trust Theresa May when she says that it'll all be taken back into our control after the transition period? What a question. And John was well able for it. I was just saying, it's why is it that you don't have any confidence in the transition period ex being exactly that, just a period of time after which Theresa May is hoping to deliver, as she promises, that the UK will take control of its fishing policy? I wonder why. Yeah, I think um, that's easy to answer because our fishing um, industry has been decimated ever since we, we joined the EU. Um, politicians have never really stood out for the fishing industry because we're such a small industry. But we are a very important industry because we are a food producer. And coastal communities that have little else rely rely on the funding and the fishing industry for the local economy. Um, 
I would, if it was something written in stone that said we're going to take it back, then that would be more acceptable. But it, it's only words, and um, we've been let down so many, many times that do we trust anyone? You know, it's, it's hard to trust anyone when you've been let down. And um, very few people have ever stood up for us as an industry. Um, you know, we have a few coastal MPs that stand up for us, but we would like the whole country to stand up for us. We were the greatest fishing nation in the world. We had the best fishing grounds in the world, but they've been traded off. We want to take back control, bring it all back to the UK, let our government administer the fishing and, you know, build our industry up again. When you look around these harbours now, a lot of the small boats in the coastal towns take their ships to sea single-handed. That's one person on a boat fishing for perhaps 16, 18 hours with no support whatsoever. We need to take back control. We want the backing of our MPs. We're the ones that put the MPs into power and I believe the British nation also wants us to have control of our waters. Brilliant man, John. I might give him a ring and try and get him on the programme in the week. Look, John, lovely man in all as he is, I wonder does he know or does he suspect or has he ever considered that this is part of a wider plan. This is all Agenda 21, Agenda 30. This is about depopulating coastal areas and rural areas. They are to be depopulated and people are to be forced into human settlement zones, urban zones. That's what this is really all about. And I wonder how much of that people like John, honest to goodness, decent, proper people, have ever considered that. Have they ever thought about that? Well, why are they doing this to us? Well, this is why they're doing it to you. Brilliant stuff from John Nichols. Also on the front of The Observer today, something about social media. Violent youths should face social media ban. This is again about all the knife crime and how it's being glorified online. And if they kick some of these kids off the internet and they can't brag about what they're doing, maybe they won't do it. That's just garbage beyond belief, but I'm not going to get into that. The front page of the Sunday Express, patients flee NHS waiting list hell. This is a big story. And again, it's something that's come up on this programme time and time again. The Sunday Express says they've seen figures suggesting the number of patients flying overseas for private medical treatment has quadrupled in four years because of times, waiting times, reaching record levels. The figures from the Office for National Statistics cover the period up to last September. Again, something not mentioned in the Sunday Express, something not mentioned on the old telly or the old radio when this is being discussed. That is, this country has grown year on year by about a quarter of a million people. That's the net migration figure average. That's the average. That is the mean figure from the mid-1990s. What is that going to do? Collapse. Collapse, 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 collapse. But if you say that, you're racist. No, I'm not racist. And the people who put that point of view forward are not racist either. You know, a box. Look at the NHS as a whole, as a box. And you get any box and you start throwing things into it, eventually the box can't take any more. And if you keep putting stuff into it, the arse end of the box collapses and everything falls out. It's an inevitability. A city the size of Swansea, I think, is created every year in this country. It's not going to change either because this transition period, which runs until New Year's Eve 2020, Christ, two and a half years away, isn't it? Yeah? One and a half, what? The best part of two and a half years, yeah. Yeah, two and three quarter years. It's going to continue. So it's only going to get worse. We'll leave that one alone. It's exactly 11 and a half minutes to the top of the hour, to midday. Here's a big story. We've been following this as well. Is there a couple of tweets there? I'm doing better with the tweets today, by the way, if I do say so myself. Getting mocked over the Chuka Omuna Saji Javid mix-up. I must be racist. 
dark skinned people must look the same to me. I bet you there's a snowflake somewhere that will say he must be racist, you know. Well, Sajid Javid, of course, is uh, is Asian. His ethnicity is Asian. Is, isn't that right? And I think uh, Chuka Amuna, I think his heritage is in Africa, as far as I know. But somebody will call me racist anyway. That's fine. That's fine and dandy. Let's have a look. Um, you can follow what other people are tweeting, by the way. Go to twitter.com. Jeff says the fishing industry in Ireland has the same issue. It, you're right, Jeff. And I'm in touch with people, uh, friends of mine, who have lived in Dunmore East in Waterford all their lives. And the, the, the scenario described by John Nichols of men taking boats out on their own, which is incredibly dangerous, that is going on in Ireland as well. In fact, my friend Jean Ann Crowley, the aforementioned, Jean Ann spends a lot of time these days on the west coast of Ireland. And I'm sure if she asked a few questions, she would find that is the case in the west of Ireland as well. Right, Chris Wiley then. Do you remember Chris Wiley? He's the so-called Canadian whistleblower in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data breach saga. And he used to head up research at Cambridge Analytica. That's the story anyway. Now, he's the man who gave the Guardian and the Observer the documents that describe the secret goings-on behind Cambridge Analytica showing that that company used unauthorised and illegally taken personal private data from 50 million Facebook user accounts. It's supposed to be 80 million now. Those data, that amount of data from 80 million people was obtained for the purpose of targeting people in the US election presidential, the US presidential election campaign. I made a balls of that, didn't I? I made a balls of that. And it's my bullet points. I'm following my own bullet points here. Shall I do that again? Right, you know this guy, Wiley, used to head up research at Cambridge Analytica, right? He gave the Guardian the documents that allegedly showed Cambridge Analytica had 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 wrongly used, with no authorization, millions of personal private data from people. Right. There's a better way of saying that. I'm not gonna you know what I'm talking about, right? Right, you know. They got all this information, they shouldn't have had it on millions of people, and they used it to target people in the presidential election and later on Brexit, of course. Just briefly just briefly, this guy was on the Mar show today. Mar questions the credibility of being able to change folks' minds with targeted ads and fake news. This is the Andrew Mar show, Chris Wiley. This all really hangs on the suggestion that using this data helps political organisations win elections and change power stru structures. Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of people would suspect that is, that is very hard to do. If people know about the films I go to see, the kind of films I like, my friends and so on, it doesn't necessarily mean that a political party knows how to change my vote. But it, does. But, it, but it does. But it does. How? Because, Why? It, because you, you have to remember that when you're building an algorithm, the algorithm isn't just looking at th that you like this particular film or that particular film. It's looking at relationships between people who like these types of films or these types of music or who use these words and different uh, psychological constructs that we know are related to that. So actually what you can do with algorithms okay. is, is understand uh, more deeper, uh, you know, what makes you tick and, and what kind of information is going to make you behave in a particular way. So uh, it's, I, not, it's, I, not just, it's not just that we're pulling okay. movies, it's that we can understand more deeply who you are. Mm, now Mar presses them on that point. Some of the people involved in doing this are sceptical about it themselves. Alexander right. Kogan, who is the academic at the sure. heart of all of this started. He says it's selling magic and actually... Well, but he, he has a vested interest in, in downplaying its, 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 its utility yeah, right. because he was deeply involved the in the misappropriation of okay. the 87 million Facebook See, records. Mark Zuckerberg says that his big mistake was allowing the bad guys to, to use his app, to use his data in the first place. Sure. And by the gad, bad guys, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Hayes, I'm afraid he means people like you. You were very involved in data harvesting for a long time and you were... You know, you were selling this service indeed to Dominic Cummings of Vote Leave or trying to. Yes, you were trying to sell this information to Vote Leave yourself, weren't you? Pot calling the kettle black. Good stuff. How does he react to this? Uh, well, uh, let me be clear. I wasn't, I, when I had... Sounds like a politician, doesn't he? Let me be clear. He also sounds incredibly articulate for somebody who came out of nowhere, Chris Wiley, with all of this information about how Trump's election was won and about how Brexit was won 
by stealing people's dad. Incredibly articulate, gifted orator, I would have said. Coming out of nowhere. Little snowflake, this guy. But amazingly articulate. In meetings with Dominic Cummings, I wasn't offering anything illegal. That's so. No, no, just, I'm not, I'm not just, just it's illegal, clear, but it, yeah. it's the same kind of. Same kind there's of a business. Big, there's a big difference between using data with people's consent and, 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 and presenting information in a targeted way where mm. people know what kind yeah. of information they're, they're receiving and can make a judgment on that. Okay. And, 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 and uh, pulling data without consent and presenting information with, with, where without, it is unclear so, so consent is wh- whether it is true or not. And, and, and this really gets to the crux of what fake news is. Because okay. if, if, if people are being targeted online without their consent or knowledge with information that isn't necessarily true, they're going to, to, to behave or vote in a particular way mm. that had they known the facts, they wouldn't necessarily they might have, have done. done. I see. Okay. So let's, that's, that's the crux of manipulation. The crux of the manipulation, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are being bombarded with fake news and have been since time immemorial through the newspapers, through their radios and through their television screens. It's ridiculous to suggest that targeted ads telling people what they need to or want them to read and see in any way influenced anything. I, I know Neil Sanders was on this programme talking about this. I have great respect for Neil and I was glad to give Neil, quite rightly, because he's an academic and, you know, he's a very, very smart guy, to give him the right to put the other side of this. But I don't agree with it. I think it's nonsense and it's highly convenient, this. And, of course, where it will end up, of course, is that you will have, basically, you will see the death of independent media because everything will be portrayed as fake news. And then all you'll get, well, all you'll get then is the nationals. That's all you'll get. Right, very quick break. Back in a minute to wrap up. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Final, final thought on the media before I go. I've got to go. Thanks for tuning in to Sunday View. Uh, the BBC continues to talk about deadly protests returning to Gaza. And this very benign language being used by the media today should never cover up the hateful, illegal, disgusting apartheid government of Israel continues today to murder innocent, unarmed people who are fighting for and standing up for their rights in the face of a brutal, massive military machine. They have my undying admiration, the Palestinians in Gaza, for standing up to it. Let the Never let the media whitewash what's going on there and what's been going on there for uh, the best part of 70 years. It's disgusting. Uh, Deadly protests returning to Gaza. What a load of bollocks by the BBC. Mass murder of innocent, unarmed people. 
Um, it's a daily occurrence in Gaza, is what the truth of that story is. I'm going to love you and leave you and say I'll speak to you tomorrow. We've got two terrific guests. Mary Ruart joins the programme tomorrow. Former presidential candidate, Mary. And it's been a long time, but my old pal Norman Finkelstein is on the programme tomorrow from uh, live from New York City. Norman's got a new book out about, of course, Israel and Gaza. And we'll talk to Norm Finkelstein tomorrow. Uh, at the usual time, of course, tomorrow, 7pm UK time. I'm going to leave you with this from my old pal, Jean Ann Crowley. Great, uh, wonderful return to the boards on Friday there in uh, Dublin's Arts Centre. Amazing talent, that woman. Let's hope we see much more from Jean Ann in the coming months and years. Look after yourselves and one another. Have a great Sunday. Leaving you with this from Lick the Tins. This is great stuff. See you soon. Bye for now.